Okay, so hi everybody. Thanks for joining in. Um, this is going to be a uh, just a, a quick primer on principal component analysis, which uh, uh, Asma and her um, talk on linear algebra last week uh, really helped uh, illustrate all the different ways in which uh, we can use such uh, algebraic analysis to refine our data. Um, and uh, because we are using the Penguin data set, uh, I looked at um, the Palmer Penguin um, package and realized that Allison Horst, uh, one of the authors of the package, uh, actually did a nice um, uh, vignette on using PCA. Now, the thing is that I couldn't load the, P the vignette myself using the command that was uh, suggested, but uh, you can actually find her. Oh, that's mine. Um, yes, if you go to her GitHub, you can find the uh, PCA uh, markdown and go through it. And she used um, some um, other uh, uh, workflow. I'm um, going to use the workflow that I'm familiar with and you can choose which you want. Hers is more in the tidyverse. Uh, mine is using uh, commands from stat, stats package, but also um, some other uh, packages that I'll go through. But um, just to uh, summarize, and I also want to point out uh, somebody, I don't know if it was Ten or uh, somebody else, uh, linked to a really nice um, post on Cross Validated that did a very good job of explaining um, principal component analysis at various levels. Uh, and um, I, I might use some of these illustrations uh, as well. Um, but our, our a challenge when we have a data set that is observations and variables is that the variables are what we are able to measure uh, and they can provide a lot of information but they can also suffer from uh, 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 correlation or covariance uh, and so if we use tools like simple or multiple regression we often have to control for uh, covariance of the variables and it all can lead to messy models in which we're adding variables in to try to explain more of the variance but because each one is doing so in a relatively inefficient manner then we're running the risk of throwing things into our model that are adding just a little bit of explanatory power um, so the idea of principal component analysis is, is to restructure our variables. That is to take, not to discard them, but to use linear algebra to make the variables more efficient by transforming them into principal components. And unlike the variables that we're using, which will have likely dimensions, um, the principal components do not have units. The, uh, they, uh, they act as dimensions, but they are unitless. Uh, the uh, other important, well, another important aspect of principal component analysis is that what we're doing is we're, we're starting out with the first principal component, which explains all of the variation in the data that is possible with one line. So we can think of it as a linear regression, but a linear regression in a multidimensional space. Typically when we're imagining linear regression, we're looking at a Cartesian plane, an XY graph, draw a line through the points, and then say that's our best fit line. Well, what we're doing in PCA is we're drawing that line in a space that perhaps we can't even imagine. If we're starting with, let's say 30 variables, we're in a 30 dimensional space, but using linear algebra, we can actually make a fit to those data points that has a best fit, okay? Uh, you know, when, once we get beyond three dimensions, it's hard to imagine, but that's in effect what we're doing mathematically. And uh, as you notice in my first paragraph, with each successive um, component after the first one, each successive component is orthogonal to the previous components. And again, if we're looking at a uh, two-dimensional space, we would say perpendicular, okay, a 90 degree. Uh, the second pr uh, principal component is 90 degrees with respect to the first. 
But of course, if we're talking about n-dimensional space, orthogonal takes on a different meaning. It means that it is perpendicular in every dimension. Uh, again, hard for us to wrap our heads around, but that is mathematically what we're doing because when we fit our first component, our first line, we're explaining all the variation in that dimension, in that direction. So necessarily, anything explaining more variance has to be at right angles to the prior component or components, okay? Um, another thing that we're doing in PCA, uh, when we're making these fits, is we are transforming the data. Now, if we look at the, if I scroll down and you look, we look at the um, uh, penguins data set, excuse me, I'm gonna close the door because I'm gonna hear dogs. So. Okay, so um, just looking at the penguins data set, there's penguins and there's penguins raw, but penguins or penguins raw or penguins, something like that. It, the, the other one, doesn't add um, any continuous variables. It adds a lot of uh, levels, a lot of uh, variables that are, would be factors or, or character type data. So I'm sticking with the minimal data set, which has only uh, eight variables, four of which are continuous numeric data. And that's really what we want to do the transformation on. Uh, what we'll do then afterwards is after we do the transformation of the four continuous variables, and in this case, they are uh, two variables pertaining to the bill, length and depth of bill, and then flipper length in millimeters, and finally, body mass in grams. So if you look at the, the data here, we have uh, um, a species a variable, island variable, which is location, then sex and year the data were collected, and then the four uh, measurement variables. And those are four are, are the ones that we are going to be working on. But what we'll do after we do this transformation is we are going to reapply the species variable and see how our, per, uh, our, our principal components have helped to distinguish uh, possibly a, a different species. Okay, um, so again, I'm drawing quite a bit from Alison Horst's vignette on, on penguin data. Uh, you can find that on her GitHub page. Um, which is uh, linked by the um, uh, Palmer Penguins uh, um, uh, package. You can find a link to that. Um, so using her code to develop a correlation matrix, what we want to do first of all with these four variables is get an idea of just how much they're correlated. And it's not a shock to realize that the two size variables, that is body mass and flipper length, are very strongly correlated, 0.87. Uh, correlation between the two. Uh, on the other hand, bill length and bill depth are negatively correlated with each other, uh, indicating that these, at least in these species of penguins, there's a, um, a set difference between long, thin bills and short, uh, thick bills. Okay. Um, now, the notice in the summary, we do have a couple of NAs in here. And all, anytime these NRAs are present, they're messing up downstream uh, analysis. And rather than um, uh, add in the, uh, um, what is it? Um, the, the, the tidy R, there's a tidy R command. What is it? Um, a drop NA, drop NA. Instead of using drop NA every single time, I just uh, did a, a, a quick um, drop NA of the four um, quantitative variables, dropping in those four variables, the two observations that had NA values, okay? And so we, we go from, um, what was it, um, 400, I can't remember. So it, it, we drop only two of the cases, uh, uh, really not uh, anything to worry about. And what we can do now is if we, if we uh, do a quick ggplot using the given variables, and for example, this is um, flipper length versus body mass. We can see just how clearly correlated those two variables are. And we can also see um, the grouping. The Gen 2 penguins are larger penguins, heavier penguins, and they have longer flippers. Not a shock that those two dimensions are correlated. The Adelie and chin strap penguins are kind of in a, 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 a mix here at the lower uh, left-hand uh, side of the graph. 
We can also look at the bill, um, uh, bill um, variables, the tooth bill variables were given length and depth. And here we can see actually see that um, the three groups of penguins seem to be um, separated on these two dimensions. Nevertheless, with these four dimensions, uh, what we're going to do is apply principal component analysis to see if we can pull out all of the useful information in these variables, assigning them to principal components that will give us the most efficient possible explanation uh, in, a, in a given number of dimensions. Okay. So, um, just to uh, explain what we're doing with principal component analysis. And again, I'm going back to this, um, this cross-validated post. Uh, I really like this illustration because what we're doing, we're doing two things at once with, uh, in applying a principal component. And you can see this illustration. I hope you, uh, please tell me if you can, I see this illustration of a rotating a line, a fitted line rotating around an origin. What we're doing first is we are centering and scaling the data. That is to say, in going back to the, um, um, our raw numbers here, one of the no things you'll notice is that the bill length and bill depth are in millimeters and they're in the tens. Flipper length is in the hundreds of millimeters and body mass in grams is in the thousands. If we do not scale these variables, the body mass is going to predominate because of the, the units. So what we want to do is, in effect, normalize, okay? And that's uh, the first thing. And the second thing we're going to do is recenter based on uh, the means of the variables. So we're recentering at a zero, zero origin, which represents averages for the variables. Uh, by doing that, by centering and scaling, we now have a Cartesian plane in which the points are effectively symmetrically distributed around the origin. And then we are use, using uh, linear algebra to determine a best fit line. Um, in this case, again, it's showing two dimensions, but we can do this with n number of dimensions. And what we're doing is we want to minimize the distance from the line to all the points, which is represented by the sum of squares of distances. But we also want to represent the maximum possible distribution of points projected onto the line. And uh, there are some elegant explanations of why we're able to accomplish both at the same time. And it's essentially applying the Pythagorean theorem because each point in effect is, if you think of the point uh, with respect to the origin, you can think of it as the hypotenuse of a right triangle, where the one leg is the distance to the line, and then the other leg is the distance from the projection on the line to the origin. And what we're doing is we're maximizing the distance of one leg and minimizing the distance of the opposite leg. But because the hypotenuse is constant, an a squared uh, plus b squared equals c squared formula, what we're doing at the same time is maximizing a squared and minimizing b squared, or vice versa. Okay, so in effect, we can do both at the same time. Minimize uh, distance from the line and maximize distance along the line in the projection. Uh, there's a nice uh, video by Josh, Josh Starmer on YouTube that also illustrates how this happens. But in effect, our best fit line uh, is, and okay, here we go. So uh, in Alice and Horst's vignette, she uses a recipes package and uh, applies a formula. I was more familiar with the PR comp function, which is in the stats package that's uh, uh, in effect part of, of base R. And uh, what this does is it creates an object. So what I'm doing is um, applying uh, two penguins clean. I'm selecting the four uh, quantitative variables, and then I'm applying the PR comp uh, uh, function. And importantly, I'm uh, uh, 
giving the argument center equals true, scale equals true. Uh, by doing this, I create an object. Uh, and an, an object, it's a list of um, uh, vectors and matrices. But what I can do is with the summary uh, um, function, I can view the importance of the components. In this case, PC1, the proportion of variance of the total data set is 68.8%, whereas PC2 is 19.3%. But you'll notice that the cumulative proportion is 88%. Okay, so we're getting, we're getting to about, uh, um, uh, what, uh, seven-eighths of the total variance uh, being explained by the two principal components. And I'll show you a graphical um, illustration of these, these uh, principal components and how much they explain that can help us make decisions about where do we want to cut off our analysis. We have four principal components because we have four variables. Uh, that means that the four principal components will ex explain 100% of the variation. But we don't necessarily want to use all four. Uh, if we can get away with using two, and have that explain the lion's share of the, the variance, then we are, we are accomplishing what we set out to do, which is reduction of dimensions. Okay. So um, in the PR comp um, object, which I've uh, assigned to this penguin PCA object, um, the um, principal components can be extracted by subsetting X, so dollar sign X, and then converting that to a tibble, and uh, a pipeline piping that to ggplot with a very basic uh, visualization. At this point, I'm not even looking at species. I'm just looking at how does the grouping look. And the grouping looks effective. It looks like two major groups uh, uh, from PC1 and PC2. So if I want to make a decision about um, how many principal components do I really want to consider in my analysis, I can use what's called a scree plot. And a scree plot is uh, available in the Facto Extra package, which is uh, useful for visualization of PCA and other um, uh, similar analyses. So using in the Facto Extra package, this uh, fvis eig for eigen, eigenvalue uh, of my object, I can create a scree plot that shows graphically just how much variation is explained by each of the four principal components. And um, this is where a decision can be made by a researcher or an anal or analyst to determine at what point the um, most efficient uh, number of principal components uh, can be used. And this is sometimes called an elbow plot. The idea is that when you see the inflection point in this case is PC2, that might be uh, an indication of where you can cut off your analysis. In this case, we already determined that 88% of the variation is explained by P uh, PC1 and PC2. I don't see a need to consider the other three dimension, other two dimensions, PC3 and PC4. Um, and so we'll continue with these two dimensions and we also have the benefit of uh, not having to uh, fit our human minds into n-dimensional space. We can just see it on the page in two dimensions. Um, and so, hey, Mike, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, what if two or more variables are collinear? Is there any way uh, you can do an initial analysis to, um, to rule them out, or will this show up collinearity if it does exist? Well, the advantage of this is that you don't have to discard any variables. So PCA is in effect uh, pardoning you for your many, many, many uh, correlated variables. And uh, just to illustrate this, because we're working with the Penguin data set, it has only four variables, but when I did this exercise the, uh, previously, I'm gonna switch to another vignette that I prepared. And this is for a um, set of uh, a data set from Wisconsin breast cancer data set. Uh, and these are cells. Uh, and cells in which you can see from the, does everybody see the, uh, can somebody uh, uh, confirm that they see the uh, glimpse of the WDBC data set? Yeah, we can see it, Mike. 
Great. Okay. So you can see that this contains um, 32 variables, uh, 30 of which are quantitative. There's just ID and then diagnosis is either malignant or benign. But there are 30 quantitative variables. And if you look at them like radius and perimeter and area, well, yes, those are going to be extremely highly correlated with each other. But we don't have to do any prior vetting of our data set. The uh, advantage of PCA is we throw everything into the blender and then we get a really nice smoothie out of it and we don't even know uh, how it was created. That's not entirely true, but uh, so with these 30 variables and I'm going to scroll down and show the screen plot and you can see the co-correlation. Co so I just did a quick um, plot of all variables. You can see some of the variables are extremely highly correlated, but I didn't discard any variables. Um, and it, I was just as a, as a proof of concept, I was doing this on two variables, but here I'm going to come down and do the PR comp on all 30 variables. And you can see that I get 30 principal components out of this. However, you can also see that the cumulative proportion, I, after four variables, I'm getting close to 80%. After six components, I should say, not variables, components, I'm getting 88.7%. And again, I would want to make a decision about how I want to cluster this. But just for illustration, I'm going to look at the first two principal components. This again is a screen plot. Um, this seems like more of a qualitative uh, decision than a quantitative decision. Again, you know, called an elbow plot. Where's the elbow? Is it at two or three? I don't know. Um, but just to take the first two components, and then graph them and then look at now mapping back benign versus malignant. Uh, and these ellipses are added in by the function that's in the um, facto extra package. But you can see that the benign um, cells or the cells from benign cancers tend to be in one cluster, whereas the malignant ones tend to be in another. And the ellipses are, are kind of a construct uh, added by this function. But for illustration purposes, you can see how we took 30 variables, took two principal components from them, and already have a clustering that is potentially informative, if not definitive. So returning to the Penguin data set, which is cleaner, um, well, easier, I should say. And I'm going to do what I just did with the, um, um, I showed with the breast cancer cells using this uh, PCA int uh, function. And now what we see from the, um, the data set, uh, now we're reapplying the species. So we left the species out and now we're adding species back in and again using these ellipses, but we can see that we're getting a rather nice clean clustering. Certainly Gen 2 is standing alone, but even Chinstrap versus Adelie penguins seem to be nicely separated by the, the two principal components that we have available to each other. Now these principal components don't mean anything in terms of weight or height or length, they are unitless, but they have been uh, 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 resulted from our transformation of the available variables that we have. And you'll also notice that in this plot, we've also got the uh, amount of variation explained by dimension one and dimension two, adding up to a little over 88%. Okay. Then finally, if we want to see the, um, how the variables correlate with each other, uh, we can do what's called a biplot. And the biplot will show when arrows are clustered near each other, it means they're heavily uh, correlated with each other. So what we notice is that flipper length and body mass are very highly correlated, whereas build depth and build length are uh, uh, inversely correlated uh, or have a negative relationship. But um, in brief, that's how we can use um, principal component an analysis to um, strip down a large number of variables into a handful of dimensions that are potentially informative and can direct 
uh, how we model our, our, our data. Uh, so that's all I have to say. I'm, I'm, welcome, I'm happy to welcome any questions. Um, let me flip over to, oh, I don't have her vignette up. Um, I was running it on my, uh, in my R session. But um, uh, if you do look at Alison Horst's um, uh, vignette, you'll see much the same as what I got to, but using different packages. And uh, you do have the options of using uh, uh, some tidy uh, packages. Uh, I did not, again, I, I, I didn't know recipes and I wasn't gonna try to learn it in an afternoon, but it looks like it, it's a potentially powerful package to, um, to apply to this type of analysis as well. And I, I think uh, between the various vignettes, also the talks by Julia Silga, where she did um, Stack Overflow data. Um, there are many uh, useful YouTube videos, uh, both by our studio and um, uh, other people uh, explaining uh, many ways to do this. But uh, uh, I, if anyone has any questions, I'll see uh, how well I can answer them. Hey, Mike, uh, it's Roman. Um, thanks for doing this again. Do you have a good intuition for what exactly it means to say the first principal component accounts for 68.8% of the variation? Like, how do you translate that into like third grade English? Okay, so um, if you were, so we have four variables, okay? So um, if we could imagine a four dimensional space, uh, all of those points could be explained by four variables because so much like let's reduce it down to two two um, two dimensional space to make it easier to think about. If we had only two variables, everything maps to x and y. So what we would be able to do is explain all the variation with the two variables that are available to us. Okay, uh, that explains a hundred percent because the um, number of variables equals the number of explanatory variables. What we're doing in this case is we're trying to push everything kind of to the left in the sense of we want all the variation possible explained by the first dimension, which is, is the first principal component. So whereas we, so if you look at it this way, if we took, instead of dimensions, if we took, um, let's say, oh, so we took, uh, um, uh, bill depth, bill length, uh, mass and body mass and flipper length, we would explain 100% of all the data points. Okay, because all our data point points are represented in four dimensions. The difference is that we would have probably a relatively flat series of bars. That is to say, and I don't know, we could try to map it out. But we would, you know, each one of those variables would explain only a certain percentage of the overall variation because of the fact of, of correlation. In this case, because we're stripping out all the correlation and making all the principal components orthogonal to each other, so completely unrelated to each other, we are ensuring that the first principal component explains as much variation possible, as, we, as mathematically possible. And we can quantify that. Out of 100% variation, we can say the first principal component is explaining 68% of that variation. Thanks. And if, if, you, um, if you do go to this, um, this exercise, this is a really clever thing, which is, uh, I'll read it aloud. Imagine a big family dinner where everybody starts asking you about PCA. First, you explain it to your great-grandmother, then your grandmother, then your mother, then your spouse, then finally to your mathematician daughter. And so you're doing this at different levels. You're, 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 so the simplest explanation is uh, we just want to be able to use some measurement to be able to distinguish uh, one member of a class from another member of a class, and in this case, they're using wines. So in the case of wines, there are going to be some variables that are not very informative, like, um, I don't know, alcohol content, and then others that potentially could be very uh, 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 useful, for example, um, uh, depth of color or um, acidity. 
Um, so what you're um, what you're doing, and, and, and I really like this 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 explanation because it was both uh, um, text and um, graphical, and I appreciated the graphs in here because they explain what we're trying to do, and then you get to the um, the covariance matrix, which is uh, in effect what Osma spoke about last week. But what you're doing is you're using the linear algebra transformation to uh, effectively um, um, condense or, or, or if, yeah, efficiently um, pack as much variation as possible into the very first component and then the next component and the next component. And the idea is that with each successive component, you are getting maximal efficiency of explanation out of each, each of those components. Any other either questions or criticisms? Hello, hey Mark. Um, this is Tony here. Hi. So, is a uh, proportion a variance explained? Is that just is that analogous to uh, R squared for just linear regression? Is it really? Because I think that I think R squared is sometimes also called. Uh, Proportion of variance explained, or something similar to that. Yeah, I, I believe you're right. I believe if you're dealing with just two dimensions and you're fitting a line, uh, um, so the the fitted line and the R squared is in effect how much. Well, I guess how much of Y is explained by X or vice versa, right? I All guess right. X. X being the independent variable and Y the dependent variable, the right way to say it is that how much of variation in Y is explained by variation in X? Yeah, I think the actual formula is like one minus some sum of squared terms over some other sum of squared terms. I forget the actual, uh, you know, there's different ways of doing the sum of squares, but uh, it's something like that too. Uh, and I think part of, yeah, part of that is uh, uh, around the variance uh, of the residuals. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and we're going to have some variables. So uh, if I go back to my, the breast cancer uh, illustration. So some of these variables, if I go back to the variables, some of these are going to be very highly correlated. We can see that in this plot uh, where some of these are basically collinear. Okay, uh, and so this is um, what? Perimeter mean versus, yeah, radius mean, of, of course, that's going to be highly correlated. On the other hand, there are going to be things like uh, what? Um, concat well, let me see, uh, smoothness, smoothness versus proven mean, and those are not strongly correlated at all. Um, so um, when we're doing a straight linear regression uh, with a, a, a two dimensions, it's easy for us to, I think, to wrap our heads around what we're, what we're doing. We're, we're getting the best fit line, and that's explaining uh, maximal variance. Uh, but when we start looking at this number of variables, it can be really um, difficult to imagine uh, what we're trying to do. The advantage of linear algebra is that it is not limited the way our minds are by two or three dimensional space. This isn't really a, a question, but I think this is a, I think it was just cool that when you're, you're talking about screen plots, um, the same concept exists with k-means and um, looking at total within sum of squared error uh, as, uh, you know, as a function of uh, k, the number of groups, uh, you kind of try to choose like the optimal number, number of clusters based off you know, just that curve that you look at uh, uh, how it changes as a function of, you know, in the terms of k means it's as a function of k. Here, it's a, it's as a function of the number of dimensions. So it's kind of cool to see that same concept process. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, when I was when I was trying to wrap my head around k means clustering versus uh, PCA and 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 the number of clusters you choose, I think there's a lot. It can be a lot more arbitrary. 
Uh, I think it's almost like a trial and error approach sometimes. Um, but my way of thinking about this, and, and you, can, you or anyone else can correct me if I'm wrong, but I tend to think of principal component analysis as acting on variables, so the columns in a data frame, and k-means clustering acting on the observations, so the rows in a data frame. And um, it, when we're clustering the observations, we're not, so we're not discarding anything, we're just trying to find grouping. In the case of PCA, we're not discarding the original variables, we're just trying to transform them into a way where we're getting the most information out of them while preserving the original variables. Mike, I have a question. Yes. Um, does this, does PCA only work with uh, continuous variables? Um, and is there like a, and if yes, then is, do you know if there's a PCA-like approach if you have a bunch of categories Categorical variables? Well, I think the difficulty with categorical variables is that uh, uh, them mathematically in a continuous way. So, um, and if you take a, a, a you know, very basic, like, you know, like gender, uh, female, male, and other, how do you, how would you? a mathematical transformation would make sense. Um, now, I suppose that there are going to be uh, integer variables that you could probably be able to use in PCA. Um, I think you could get away with using integers, but I don't think you could use, get away with using anything that is, is a factor represented as a number simply because uh, the number is a proxy. The number doesn't really mean anything. There's no reason for female to be one and male to be two or male to be one and female to be two. Uh, and um, so I've never encountered PCA being applied to, 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 to non-numerical data. Okay. I mean, actually, I'm far from an expert on this, but take a look at factor analysis or correspondence analysis. I think those are the um, the PCA corollaries for categorical data. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. I suppose if you also wanted to, or if your categorical variables had multiple categories or multiple factors, if you had, you know, high, medium, low, one, two, three, you could sort of use that as Mike said as a proxy. But you um, know, I think PCA is pretty much for continuous or or numerical data. Um, another thing that I was kind of thinking about, you know, comparing the, the PCA to the k-means is k-means basically just looks at the, the mean, you know, just looks at the, the data and finds the mean of a group, whereas PCA looks at the mean, yes, but it also looks at the spread and actually maximizes the spread. So k-means doesn't really get into that spread. The spread is basically spherical as far as k-means is concerned. It doesn't have any other oblong or ovoid shape, whereas PCA can have elongated, actually that's the goal of PCA, to elongate that variance as much as possible, stretch it out as far as possible, get the maximum variance. Um, so that's that's another way that I kind of look at it. Um, yeah. We discuss loadings, Mike, in 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 context of kind of getting the PCA factors and and sort of getting a handle on what they mean, sort of contextually and sort of you know it, sort of um, because I think that's that's a you know I, a lot of people that I talk to in business you know don't like PCA because you know it gives you this factorless value they want to talk about dollars being equivalent to and related to you know this and that or you know they want you know answers to their 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 um, to their values yeah and and and, and, and uh, their answer, excuse me yeah Matt thanks for that and actually the uh, Josh Starmer video I, I mentioned does a very good job of mapping the principal components back onto the original variables. And he, yeah. he uses the analogy of a cocktail. He says, uh, so if you want to know how principal component, component one is represented, 
it's 0.7 of this variable plus right. 0.3 of this variable minus 0.2 of this variable. And so that way, you know, it matters you're saying, you, you can say, well, what we found is that this is the ideal explanation for the variation in your data set mapped back onto the variables that you wanted to be mapped back onto. Um, and, you know, at least that would ground it in, in, in the, um, uh, you know, in what they're trying to understand. I mean, like in this case, we can pretty much say that principal component one is mostly going to be uh, flipper length mm -hmm. and body mass. And then principal comp component two is where the bill, the, the, the size and shape of the bill comes into play. And so another you, way that, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no. So I, I, I guess, I, yeah, I, I think it can be kind of, you know, mathematical wizardry, but there is a way to bring it back to right. the variables and say, here's how it maps. One thing that I do sometimes in when I explain PCA to people is I, I sort of give them the Rubik's cube as a starting point. And I say, look, if you rotated this Rubik's cube, you know, there's a way that you can get one axis to disappear in a sense. It has no variance. It's basically a point if you're looking down that one axis, but the other axes, you know, let's say axis one and two are now be able to rotate and sort of get the maximum values that way. So it's you're, you're spinning that cube to get different viewpoints to maximize one variance and minimize others. Well, That's kind of my, my idea of it. But if you pull out a Rubik's Cube to a lot of people, they're just going to throw it at you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Well, yeah, yeah. It, it dates it, me. I'm sorry, but still. Sure. And you brought up k-means clustering, and, 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 and uh, I don't know if we'll get to that in this, in this uh, uh, group, but the thing about k-means clustering that kind of bugs me is you can just keep increasing the number of groups and until it looks right. You know, and it's and it's kind of like, well, how would you like it to look? Uh, and, yeah. and, and you know, you can do twelve. You know, k equals twelve if you want to. Does it make sense? Is it logical? Well, it everything's kind of, you know, colored differently. And and I find that the, the uh, somewhat more arbitrary. And maybe I, I'm wrong about that, but I absolutely. Yeah, you think so? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, in k means, I guess, you know, if you, if I think about it one way, the best sorting is where you have as many um, um, categories as you have variables. I mean, every variable should have its own category. Every variable should have its own, you know, center. So if you had uh, 100 samples, the best category categorization is 100 groupings. But that's, that's ridiculous. You know, that goes counter to what we want to do is put things into groups. So, it, you know, it's, it is a very sort of problematic thing. Yeah. 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 It's an it's a interesting toy. Yeah. Oh, it is. It is. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the, um, you know, the next step being, you know, putting, um, putting, putting distributions onto the, the K means, you know, is, is kind of the next step of, you know, what happens when you, you know, put a, a, a Gaussian distribution on each K means. And that's kind of a better way to sort of think about possibly, you know, those types of groupings. But that's yeah. another lecture altogether. Sure. Yeah. How, how do you guys interpret the phrase um, measure the variation in the data set? You know, like it's one thing when you have like a specific outcome, like if you want to predict like rates of hospitalization or, you know, something numeric, but what exactly does it mean to measure the amount of variation in the data set, just like pra practically? Well, in, in practical terms, uh, um, you are, I mean, um, if you look at this this matrix here that I've got up from the breast cancer data set, you can see that in some cases, they what you there's what you would call limited variation between two variables. That is to say that they're very they're they're very highly correlated with each other. Whereas some of the cloud like distributions, you would say much greater variation. That is to say, if you fitted a line to this graph 
you're going to get somewhere upwards of 98% probably a variation explained. Whereas you try to fit a, a line, your best fit line to this, you're probably looking at 10 or 20%, I'm guessing. But I, I think, so it, so when we talk, I'm talking about variation, I think we're talking about, um, I mean, in each, each dimension, you're going to have a range. But I think when we're talking about variation in terms of explanatory variables or explanatory dimensions is how much of that can we account for with a single variable or two variables or three variables? I agree. I think another way that I kind of look at it is, you know, thinking ahead just a minute, you know, you have latent variables, hidden variables. You know, if, if you could explain the data by beak length and beak width alone, you know, that would be one thing, but there's more variation, there's more variance, there's more spread of the data that cannot be sort of um, described. And those variables might be latent, might be hidden somehow. So that's kind of an idea of the variation in my mind. Um, yeah, but that's a good question though. I mean, you know, what makes up those variables? That's, you know, that's, that's a good question. I mean, that's, that's the key question sometimes. You don't know. Thanks. I mean, you know, uh, bringing it to like a real world example, uh, if you wanted to explain the 7 billion, what is it, 8 billion now humans on Earth, where would you start? What variables would you try to choose to account for variation? And how, 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 how many variables would you need to get something where you feel satisfied that you can account for whatever, whatever, whatever it is you're trying to measure. Is there some formula that, that would point, you know, some formula that made up with variables and coefficients that would point to an individual person out of those 7 billion? You know, could you measure my nose length? And, you know, that, that sort of point to a group of people and measure my ear length and could that measure another group of people and, and finally hone that down to one person out of, you know, billions and billions, that's, that's kind of part of it. You know, what do you want to measure? What's, what's pertinent? Yeah, I, you know, since, yeah. since I'm a big baseball fan and I, you know, I grew up on baseball stats, it's always amazing to me when somebody is an outlier as a performer, that they break the established model. And you'll get people who will say, no, that can't be. He can't do that. He can't continue to do that. And then he continues to do that. And, and they'll be like, He's just weird. He's a weirdo, you know. But yeah. they, he's they a freak. freak. Yeah, the model yeah. is not 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 holding up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean outliers are good sometimes. You want to be that outlier sometimes. Yeah, uh, hit yeah. more than the rest. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Good. I I don't I, I haven't heard. Uh, let's see. Um, how many did we end up here with here? Ten. Okay. Any any other comments or questions? Sounds very quiet. It's very quiet. I can hear the crickets. I'm going to take that as everybody is everybody's brain is full. Um, I think we're satiated. Yeah. <laughs> um, Osma, do you want to talk about next week's session? Sure. Thank you, Mike. This was really good. Um, next week we'll do probability, uh, it will be a review, and after that we'll get started with the textbook officially. So hope to see you all there next week, and have a great night. Thank you.